Memoirs of the Reverend George Whitfield, Chapter 18, from his arrival at Edinburgh, 1759, to his opening a Countess of Huntingdon's Chapel at Bath, 1765. About the beginning of July, 1759, he came to Edinburgh. The congregations were never more numerous or attentive than here and at Glasgow. Yet he complains in his letters that with respect to the power of religion, it was a dead time in Scotland in comparison with London and several other parts of England. During his stay, the sum he collected for the benefits of the orphan hospital amounted to 215 pounds. This year's visit to Scotland occasioned an occurrency which redundant much to his credit and finally cleared him of the charges of mercenary and sordid motives brought against him very unjustly by some of his adversaries. A Miss Hunter, a young woman of considerable fortune, made him an offer of her whole estate, both money and lands, amounting to above 7,000 pounds, which he generously refused, and upon his declining to accept it for himself, she again offered it for the benefit of the institution in Georgia, which he also absolutely refused. These are facts too well known to be denied. This winter he continued in London, during which he wrote a prefix to Dr. Samuel Clark's Bible. He also considerably enlarged his chapel, which was far too small to contain the congregation. On the 14th of March, 1760, he collected at Tottenham Court Chapel and Tabernacle upwards of 400 pounds for the relief of the distressed Prussians who suffered so much from the savage cruelty of the Russians at Newmark, Custon, etc. For this disinterested act of benevolence, he received the thanks of his Prussian majesty. And in the summer of 1760, he traveled through Colchestershire and Wales and afterwards to Bristol. When he preached at the tabernacle, many more attended than the place would hold. And in the fields, there were supposed to be 10,000. About this time, he underwent a new sort of persecution, which, however, men of the greatest eminence have sometimes experienced, being burlcute. Bur and ridiculed in a manner the most ludicrous and profane on the stage of the Theatre Royal Dury Lane. Many acts of violence had been offered to his person, but his enemies now being convinced that the law would not permit them longer to proceed in that way with impunity, determined to try the effect of mockery. For this purpose they procured for their tool Mr. Samuel Foote, a man well qualified to act in mimic, who, having imitated Whitfield's person and action with success and spoke some ludicrous sentences in his manner, was thereby encouraged to write a farce called The Minor to be performed at Drury Lane. Whitfield takes notice of this in a letter dated August 16, 1760. It seems to have taken its rise from the malice of the playhouse people after they had failed and their attempt to detour him from preaching at Longacre Chapel, and even still more exasperated by his building a chapel of his own in Tottenham Court Road. A letter was written to David Garrick Esquire, occasioned by the intended representation of the minor. This letter was supposed to been, have been written by the Reverend Martin Madden. This theor the theoretical theatrical piece by its horrid blasphemy and, and impiety, excited the just indignation of every serious person. The impetus author, intending to expose Mr. Whitfield to public contempt, made no scruple to treat the very expressions and sacred doctrines of the Bible with that profane ridicule which a sober-minded Mohammedan would blush at. Or to put the most favorable construction upon the matter, he and the agents employed at the tabernacle and chapel to procure materials were so shamefully ignorant of the inspired writings as not to know that what they took for Mr. Whitfield's peculiar language was that of the word of God. However, they lost their labor, for by their endeavors to lessen the number of his followers, they increased them and brought thousands more to hear the gospel. And thus providence gave him 
the victory over them, baffling all the schemes of the Prince of Darkness. Here it will not be admissed to insert the following account of Edinburgh. Mr. Foot footnote. One evening while Foote was exhibiting Whitfield in public, to public ridicule in the theater of Drury Lane, the venerable man himself was engaged in preaching at Tottenham Court Chapel. His subject was the joys of heaven. Towards the close of his discourse, when his piety, his imagination, and his eloquence were on fire, he cried out in the midst of a melted and enraptured assembly, pointing to the heavens, There, there, an ungodly foot tramples on the saints no more. End of the footnote. Being manager of the Edinburgh Theatre in the winter of 1770, the manor was acted there. The minor was acted there. The first night it was pretty full, as people fond of any novelty were led to it without knowing anything of the nature of the performance. But such was the public scene of the impurity and indecency of it when known that on the second night only ten women appeared. When it was acted on Saturday, November the 24th, a dispute arose among the spectators whether it was proper to bring Whitfield upon the stage, as he was now dead. This, however, was done and raised a general indignation in the inhabitants of that city. Next day, several ministers, the Reverend Dr. Erskine, Dr. Walker, etc., took notice of it in their discourses from the pulpit. Dr. Walker, whose church was frequented by people of the higher rank, observed in his lecture upon 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 through 21, that he could not read the 17th verse. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, without expressing the just indignation he felt. Upon hearing that last night a profane piece of buffoonery was publicly acted in which this sacred doctrine is ridiculed, the Reverend Mr. Blaine of the Kurt of Relief preached a sermon on the occasion, December the 2nd, from Psalms 94, verse 16. Towards the conclusion, he says, how base and ungrateful is such treatment of the dead, and that too so very nigh to a family of orphans, the records of whose hospital will transmit Mr. Woodfield's name to uh, posterity with honor when the memory of others will rot. How illiberal such usage of one whose seasonable good service for his king and country are well known, and whose indefatigable labors for his beloved master were countenanced by heaven. May 14, 1760, he preached at Tottenham Court Chapel from Hosea 11, verse 8 and 9. And at the tabernacle in the evening, when his text was the last verse of the 80th Psalms. At the former place, he collected 222 pounds, 8 shillings, and 9 pence. And at the latter, 182 pounds, 15 shillings, and 9 pence for the distressed Protestants and Prussia. Thus, it appears that his benevolent disposition led him strictly to observe public occurrences, and surely no man more carefully endeavored to approve them. The month of September and October 1760, he spent in traveling and preaching through Yorkshire, and passed the winter in London in his usual manner. February the 13th, 1761, being a day appointed for a general fast, he preached early in the morning at the tabernacle from Exodus 34, verse 3, and collected 112 pounds. In the forenoon again at the chapel from Joel 2.15, after sermon, the collection amounted to 242 pounds, and in the evening he preached at the tabernacle from Genesis 7, verse 1, and collected 210 pounds. These sums, amounting to 564 pounds, were immediately applied to the noble purposes for which they were collected, the relief of the poor afflicted German Protestants, and the unhappy sufferers by fire at Boston. 400 pounds were conveyed to the Germans through the hands of the Reverend Mr. Z-I-E-G-E-N-H-A-G-E-N. -E -E Boston, February the 27th, 1764, at a meeting of the freeholders and other inhabitants of the town of Boston on Friday last, it was voted unanimously that the thanks of the town be given to the Reverend George Whitfield for his charitable care and pains in connecting collecting a considerable sum of money in Great Britain for the distressed sufferers by the Great Fire in Boston in 1760, and a respectable committee was appointed to wait on Mr. Whitfield to inform him of the vote and present him with a copy thereof. But his bodily health, which had often been very bad, now grew worse and worse. 
so that in August 1761 he was brought to the very gates. Yet the Lord was pleased to raise him again. It was happy for him that he frequently obtained the assistance of clergymen from the country at this time, particularly the Reverend John uh, Burridge, vicar of Everton, Bedfordshire, fellow of Clare Hall, Cambridge, and chaplain to the Right Honorable, the Earl of B-U-C-H-A-N, of whom he writes, A new instrument is raised up out of Cambridge University. He has been preaching with great fame and like an angel of the church indeed. After his recovery, which was very gradual, he was so extremely weak as to be unable to labor as formerly, and therefore left London and visited Bristol, Exeter, and Plymouth. He now found himself much better, though not able to bear the fatigue of long journeys and frequent preachings as he used to do. Of this he complains in October 1761, I have not preached a single sermon for some weeks. Last Sunday I spoke a little, but I feel its effects ever since. A sea voyage seems more necessary to me now than ever. I now know what nervous disorders are. Blessed be God that they were contracted in his service. I do not repent, though I am frequently tempted to wish that the report of my death had been true, since my disorder keeps me from my old delightful work of preaching. In a, ser in a journey this month to Leeds and Newcastle, although he was unable to bear riding in a post-chase, he could preach but seldom, and his friends prudently refrained from pressing him. I hope, however, says he, I am traveling in order to preach. Accordingly, he journeyed slowly to Edinburgh and Glasgow, and was in London till the month of December when he was much recovered. While he attributed instrumentality to this following, the advice and prescriptions of several eminent physicians in Edinburgh, being convinced, as he said, that their directions had been more blessed than all the medicines and advice he had elsewhere. His health being in a great measure restored, he could not refrain from his beloved work. And writes from Bristol, April 1762, Bristol Air agrees with me. I have been enabled to preach five times this last week without being hurt. Who knows, but I may yet be restored so far as to sound the gospel trumpet for my God. The quietness I enjoy here with daily writing out seems to be one very proper means. Notwithstanding his weakness and shortness of breath, he still continued preaching four or five times a week to the middle of May, and now and then was unable to take the field, as he called it in which exercise he much delighted. Mounts, says he, are the best pulpits, and the heavens are the best sounding boards. Oh, for a power equal to my will, I would fly from pole to pole, publishing the everlasting gospel of the Son of God. After his return to town, his zealous excursions, increasing cares and labors affected his spirits and brought him low again. He therefore resolved on a voyage to Holland, and accordingly set out in the month of July. The sea air agreed so well with him that finding himself much better, he writes from Norwich, July 31. The expedition to Holland was, I trust, profitable to myself and others. And if ever my usefulness is to be continued at London, I must be prepared for it by a longer itineration both by land and water. At present, blessed be God, I can preach once a day, and it would do your heart good to see what an influence attends the words. All my old times are revived again. August the 18th, he arrived at Edinburgh. From thence, went to Glasgow. Preached at each place alternatively every day. And at Cambus Lang twice till September the 13th, when he returned to England. And rejoiced at the news of an expected peace, hoping soon to embark for America. During his stay in England, he was not able to preach more than once a day through extreme weakness and bodily pain. At Leeds, Bristol, and Plymouth, he labored with greater ease and pleasure. But of London, he says, as affairs are circumstanced, everything there tends to weigh me down. Having therefore engaged some of his dearest, dearest and most intimate friends to take upon them the whole care and management of the affairs of his chapel and tabernacle with his other concerns in England, he set sail in the month of March, 1763, for Greenock in Scotland. In this tour, he preached at Everton, Leeds, Aberford, uh, Kitpack, and Newcastle, and also was employed in writing his observations 
in answer to Bishop Warburton. For some weeks after his arrival in Scotland, he regularly preached once a day, but was obliged by the return of his former complaint when at Edinburgh to refrain from the most part for almost six weeks. At length, he embarked six times for America on the 1st of June in the ship Fanny, Captain Ar um, Archibald um, Galbraith, bound for Greenock to Virginia and arrived there in the latter end of August after a voyage of 12 weeks. Thanks to a never-failing Redeemer, says he, I have not been laid by an hour through sickness since I came on board. A kind captain and a most orderly and quiet ship's company who gladly attended when I had breath to preach. Scarce an earth have I heard upon deck, and such a stillness has been through the whole ship, both on weekdays and the Lord's Day, as has from time to time surprised me. He dated his letters in September, October, and November from Philadelphia. Though still reduced by weakness, yet he continued to preach twice a week. Here, says he, are some young bright witnesses rising up in the church. Perhaps I have already conversed with 40 new creatures, ministers of various denominations, 16 popular students. I am credibly informed were converted in New Jersey College last year. What an open door if I had strength. Last Tuesday, we had a remarkable season among the Lutherans. Children and grown people were much impressed. It was his earnest wish to go immediately to Georgia, but he was absolutely dissuaded by his physicians till he recovered his strength. In the latter end of November, he left Philadelphia and went to New York, preaching several times, by the way, at the College of New Jersey and also at Edinburgh Town, with much approbation and success. His spirits now revived so that he was unable to preach three times a week. During his stay in New York in the winter, he writes, prejudices in this place have most strongly subsided. The better sort flock as eagerly as the most common people in our flock of coming for private gospel conversation. Congregations continue very large, and I trust saying impressions are many upon many. This appears by the following account taken from the Boston Gazette. New York, Jan January 23, 1754. The Reverend George Whitfield has spent several weeks with us, 64, preaching twice a week with more general approbation than ever, and has been treated with great respect by many other gentlemen and merchants of this place. During his stay, he preached two charity sermons, the one on the occasion of the annual collection for the poor, in which double the sum was collected that ever was upon the like occasion. The other was for the benefit of Mr. Uh, Wheelock Indian School at Lebanon in New England, for which he collected, notwithstanding the present prejudices of many people against the Indians, the sum of 120 pounds. In his last sermon, he took a very affectionate leave of the people of this city, who expressed great concern at his departure. May God restore this great and good man, in whom the gentleman, the Christian, the accomplished orator, shines forth with such peculiar luster to a perfect state of health and continue him long a blessing to the world and the Church of Christ. Having left New York, he preached at East Hampton Bridge, Hampton and Southhold, on Long Island, at Shelter Island, and at New London, Warwich and Providence, on the mainland, in his way to Boston, where he arrived at the latter end of February 1764, and was welcomed by many with great affection. But as the smallpox was spreading through the town, he preached for some time in the parts adjacent. At Newbury, in particular, a divine power attended the word preached. From Concord, he writes to his friend, Mr. S., How would you have been delighted to have seen Mr. Wheelock's Indians? Such a promising nursery of future missionaries, I believe, was never seen in New England before. Pray, encourage it with all your might. I also wish you would give some useful puritanical books to Harvard College Library, lately burnt down. The estimation in which he was held by the gentlemen of Harvard College will be seen by the following. At a meeting at the President and Fellows of Harvard College, August 22, 1768, the Reverend G. Whitfield, having, in addition to his former kindness to Harvard College, lately presented to the library a new edition of his journals and having procured large benefactions from several uh, benevolent and respectable gentlemen voted that the thanks of the corporation be given 
to the Reverend Mr. Whitfield for these instances of candor and gen gen generosity. Present, the President, Dr. Elliott, Mr. Appleton, Dr. Cooper, uh, Mr. Professor Winthorpe, get your copy, Treasurer Hobart, Kerr E. Holyoke, President. In the month of April, the, his disorder returned, but not so violently as to prevent him long from preaching, and the Bostonians flocked with great earnestness to hear him. He left Boston in order to proceed immediately southward, but messengers were sent after him to persuade him to return. June 1, 1764, he writes, Friends have even constrained me to stay here for fear of running into the summer heat. Hitherto I find the benefit of it. Whatever it is owing to, though mercy, through mercy I am much better in health than I was this time twelve months, and can preach thrice a week to a very large auditory without hurt. And every day I hear of some brought under concern. This is all of grace. He again left Boston to the great grief of his friends after a sorrowful party and came back to New York. And from thence his letters are dated from June to the end of August. At present, says he, my health is better than usual. And as yet I have felt no inconvenience from the summer heat. I have preached twice lately in the fields, and we sat under the blessed Redeemer's shadow with great delight. My late excursions upon Long Island, I trust, have been blessed. It would surprise you to see about 100 carriages at every sermon in the New World. He spent the months of September and October at Philadelphia, where the provost of the college read prayers for him. Both the president and the late governor, with the principal gentlemen of the city, attended. He received the thanks of the trustees for speaking for the charity children and recommending the institution. Leaving Philadelphia, he continued his journey southward through Virginia. And November 22nd, through New Brunswick in Carolina, he writes thus, At New Bern last Sunday, good impressions were made. From that place to this, I have met with what they call new lights in almost every stage. I have the names of several of their preachers. This, with every other place being open and exceedingly desires to hear the gospel, makes me almost determined to come back early in the spring. Having preached at Charleston, he once more arrived at Savannah and had the happiness to find the state of the colony as prosperous as he could wish. The colony, says he, is rising fast, nothing but plenty at Pesetta, and all arrears, I trust, will be paid off before I leave it, so that in a short time I hope to be freed from these outward encumbrances. And he was not disappointed in his expectations. He writes, Pesetta, January 14, 1765, God hath given me great favor in the sight of the governor, council, and assembly. A memorial was presented for an additional grant of land consisting of 2,000 acres. It was immediately complied with. Both houses addressed the governor in behalf of the intended college as warm an answer was given. Every heart seems to leap for joy at the prospect of its future utility. Again, Becerra, February 13. Yesterday morning, the governor and the, and the Lord Jag, with several other gentlemen, favored me with their company to breakfast. And how was my Lord surprised and delighted? After expressing himself in the strongest terms, he took me aside and informed me that the governor had showed him the accounts by which he found what a great benefactor I had been, and that the intended college would be of the utmost utility to Georgia and the neighboring provinces, and that the plan was beautiful, rational, and practical, and that he was persuaded His Majesty would highly approve of it and also favor it with some peculiar marks of his royal bounty. He adds in the same letter, Now farewell, my beloved Bethsaida, surely the most delightful place in all the southern parts of America. What a blessed winter have I had. Peace and love and harmony and plenty reign here. Mr. Wright hath done much in a little time. All are surprised at it. But he hath worked day, night and day, and not stirred a mile for many weeks. Thanks be to God, all outward things are settled on this side the waters. The auditing, the accounts, and laying the foundation for a college hath silenced enemies and comforted friends. The finishing of this affair confirms my call to England at this time. Having left the Seda in such comfortable circumstances, he determined on the 18th of February to delay his intended journey to the northward, judging it best to sail immediately for England to settle the college affairs. However, he spent part of the month of March 
in Charleston, and then taking an affectionate farewell, proceeded towards Philadelphia, preaching at many places by the way, especially at Newcastle. He says, all along from Charleston to this place, the cry is, for Christ's sake, stay and preach to us. Oh, for a thousand lives to spend for Jesus. There being no vessel at Philadelphia, bound for England, he sailed for New York, and in the Earl of Halifax packet, and once more landed in England, July 5, 1765. He writes, we have had but a 28 days passage. The transition hath been so sudden that I can scarce believe I am in England. I hope we're long to have a more sudden transition into a better country. When he arrived, he was very ill of a nervous fever, which left him extremely weak in body and prevented him from exerting himself as he had been used to do. Yet, far from being discouraged, he continued to do all the good he could, being in expectation of soon entering into his eternal rest. Oh, to end life well, says he, methinks I have now but one river to pass over, and we know of one that can carry us over without being ankle deep. On the 6th of October, he was called to open the Countess of Huntington's beat, or chapel at Bath. His text was 2 Corinthians 6.16. He says the chapel is extremely plain, and yet equally grand, a beautiful original. All was conducted with great solemnity. Though a very wet day, the place was very full. I preached in the morning, the Reverend Mr. Townsend of PEWSY, in the evening. End of chapter 18, having been read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to devour.